Hi friends, you want to hear an amazing fact. There are a number of very wealthy religious institutions in the world, but probably the wealthiest by far would be the Roman Catholic Church. It's hard to put an exact fix on their assets, but when you take into account the silver, the gold, the priceless artworks, and the real estate all around the world, it's in the trillions. You know, Bible prophecy talks about some very powerful and wealthy religious organizations in the last days. Stay with us. We're going to talk about it in this presentation of Revelation Now. Hello, friends. We'd like to welcome you all to Revelation Now. Everything is about to change. We want to welcome those joining us across the country and around the world, part of our extended audience in this in-depth Bible prophecy seminar, looking at some of the most important prophecies in the Bible. Tonight, we have a very important presentation, getting into the very heart of Revelation. So you might want to tell your friends to tune in even now to participate in this special Revelation seminar. We'd also like to let you know that we do have live Spanish translation if you'd like to get that, just go to the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook or YouTube channel. And also, as mentioned before, we are doing sign language for the deaf, and that's also available at the Revelation Now website. We want to thank the many of you who have written in to tell us that you are participating in this series. And I just want to mention a few of those that we've received some emails from. Alvina from Liberia writes, I just wanted to thank you from the depths of my heart for these wonderful messages and this series, Revelation Now. We have Katana listening from Micronesia. She says, it's been a blessing watching all of these presentations. I have learned a lot. Thank you. Esther is listening from Mozambique. She says, we are enjoying these powerful presentations from Maputo, Mozambique. We have learned a lot. Thank you for your ministry. And then finally, we have a picture we'll put up on the screen for you. This is uh, Felipe from El Salvador. And he's got an interesting story. He says, we installed speakers in our town and there are about 50 families listening every night. Thank you for these great presentations. So we'd like to greet all of those in El Salvador that are watching this program. We also want to thank our translators who are translating this program into Spanish, making it available for so many people in South America and Central America, as well as the other translators who are translating in Serbian and several other languages. Well, our program tonight is entitled The Daughter's Deadly Dance. And as we usually do, we have a lesson that goes along with the presentation. And that is available for free download at the Revelation Now website. Just Revelation Now, click on the resource. You can download tonight's lesson. And we encourage you to read through it. You'll be able to open up your Bible, look up the verses, fill in the different answers, and you'll be encouraged by that. Our free gift for you is a book entitled... America and the Ten Commandments. If you'd like to get this book for free, just text the word COMMANDMENT to the, no to the number 40544 and you'll receive a digital download of the book. If you're outside of North America, you can also just go to the Revelation Now website and you'll be able to download the book America and the Ten Commandments. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward. As mentioned, we have a very important presentation tonight, so we want to give Pastor Doug as much time as possible. We will be taking your Bible questions, as we normally do, following the program tonight. So if you're watching on Facebook, you can type in the comment section, type in your Bible question. We'll try and answer as many as we can. Amen. All right, Pastor Doug, well, let's start with prayer, and we'll get right to it. Dear Father, we thank you again that we're able to gather together and open up your word and uh, we have an extended audience uh, across this country and around the world who are studying together with us. So we want to ask your special blessing. Thank you that your spirit has promised to speak to our hearts. Help us to understand these important Bible truths. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And again, we'll be back doing Bible questions. So don't go away after this presentation. We just take about a two and a half minute break. We hope that you'll be Facebooking us in those questions and we'll do our best to answer them afterward. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you've tuned in tonight. We have a very important presentation talking about, really, the USA in Bible prophecy. And, you know, I just want to give a little shout out. I heard Pastor Ross say uh, some people in Micronesia are watching, and they mentioned before the broadcast, I think it's the island of Ponape. And I was there twice doing some mission trips, 
and I learned how to say good evening, everybody. I think it's Sotik Malkarusia. Now, I'll never get to do that again, so I just wanted to give a special greeting to our friend. Well, I can say it in Russian. Dobre vecher, Drusia. Buenas noches, amigos. Wait, wait, I got one more. Anivanikum, Malivanikum. That's in um, Tamil, I think. <laughs> anyway, got to use up all the foreign language I know. That was it right there. So we're just so glad that you've tuned in. Uh, we need to pray as we go into our study tonight because we are talking about some, oh, it just doesn't get any bigger and heavier than this. And I hope you put your seatbelt on and you will pray for me as I share because we're going to delve into some of the most important Bible prophecies. We're going to be talking about America in prophecy and we'll also be talking about what happened there in Europe, according to Revelation Babylon, Revelation 17. But before we do, it's always fun to go out on the streets and uh, listen to some of our citizens around the country answer the questions about, is America mentioned in prophecy? I do not believe the Bible talks about the USA in prophecy. The Bible does, does not talk about the United States in the prophecy. No, the U.S. has not been mentioned in, in uh, Bible prophecies specifically because that would be impossible. The Bible's written 3,000 years ago. Well, I'm trying to remember the scripture right now, but right now with COVID-19 going on and the things that's going on in 2020, this is in the Bible. I believe the United States plays a big role in history. Um, I don't... I don't, know, I don't know how to really get too deep into it, but I, it does play a really big role. Uh, Babylon was uh, the big sin city. It was a uh, kind of, I would kind of compare it to the United States in some current times, right? Babylon has always been the uh, area where city, whatever you want to call it, that um, is very wealthy, a lot of decadence, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So um, the harlot is that Babylon. Well, there you have it, friends. We've got an uh, interesting spectrum of views on whether or not Bible prophecy talks specifically about America. I'll tell you right at the onset that I believe it definitely does. And we're going to give you some biblical answers and reason for that in our presentation. Study tonight is called The Daughter's Dance. And that title really is reflecting that in Bible prophecy, women are often uh, synonymous with uh, a church. And uh, we have a story that we're going to look at, and the story comes to us from the life of John the Baptist, who you find mentioned in several Gospels. He was the forerunner of Jesus. He's the one who first announced that Jesus was the Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus declares that John was the greatest of the prophets. But because of John's bold and honest preaching, he made a few enemies. He called the religious leaders a den of vipers, and that didn't win him any awards. But what really got him in trouble is when he told King Herod, the Tetrarch, that he should not be married to his brother's wife, that it was adultery. And this king, who is supposedly acquainted with Jewish law, should have known better. Well, the woman he married, Herodias, uh, she was a, a pretty sinister character, and she wanted to plot how to get rid of John. You can read that in Luke 3, 19 and 20. But Herod, the Tetrarch, that's uh, the king. He was basically the, the governor of Judea under the Romans. Being reproved by him for all the evils which Herod had done, shut up John in prison. But he was afraid to do anything more than put him in prison because he really believed that he was a man of God. So he's trying to make his wife happy and, and try not to make the people angry. Well, she was plotting how she could get rid of John before her husband let him go again. And Herod had a birthday party. And everybody that was anybody in the area was invited. And, and he had uh, a few too many drinks. And then he made a promise. You see, his uh, stepdaughter, Salome, the daughter of Herodias, he said if she would come out and dance, he'd give her anything she wanted up to half his kingdom. So it says she went forth and she danced and I guess she entertained the guests and the king said, what do you want? Up to half my kingdom. You've probably heard that expression before. And she went to her mother, Herodias, and said, what shall I ask for? And she didn't ask for a credit card or a new transistor radio. The mother said, ask for the head of John the Baptist. So when Herod heard this, he was reluctant, but he had made a promise in front of all these guests and a king's word is law. 
So with dispatch, he sent an executioner, no fanfare, alone in prison, John was beheaded. And Jesus said he was the greatest of the prophets. And you know, tells us there's a lot of God's children, his servants, his martyrs that have died alone in prisons through history. Then, you know the expression, head on a platter? The head of John the Baptist was brought to the daughter and the mother on a silver platter. And that, of course, became a metaphor for a person that's uh, receiving severe judgment. We're going to go to our first question in our study tonight. We've got a lot of material to cover. Tell you ahead of time, may go a little longer and cut into our question time, but I want to cover this well. I've got an old timer used to say, if you're going to cut wood, make every lick count. And so I'm going to try and make every lick count because this is my opportunity to make this subject clear. What other mother-daughter team persecuted God's people in the Old Testament? Well, you can read about 1 Kings 18, 13. Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord. So what you have here is you've got a very famous Old Testament story where this pagan queen, uh, Jezebel, she was from the, uh, the region of the Zidonians, Tyre, and Herod the king, I'm sorry, Ahab the king, Jewish king, married her, and this pagan queen manipulated the state, her husband, the king, to persecute the prophets of God and replace the prophets of God of Jehovah with the prophets of Baal. And during the time of her reign, there's three and a half years of severe persecution and famine. And Elijah the prophet is hiding in the wilderness. He finally comes out of the wilderness and uh, there's a great judgment that falls on the prophets of Baal. So you've got this 1,260 year period of time from during the famine in the days of Elijah. Jezebel, now Jezebel had a daughter. Jezebel was in the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom where Jerusalem was, Judea. Her daughter Athaliah married the king Joram and she persecuted the prophets down there. And when Athaliah saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal seed. She did not want the sons of David displacing her. So she killed the ones that rightly had the right to the throne. But one, Joash, escaped. Here you've got another mother-daughter team persecuting the people of God. Well, I thought, I'll throw in one more. Um, many people don't realize that even in the book of Esther, the book of Esther begins with a three-and-a-half-year period. In the third year of the reign of Ahasuerus, the king had a feast lasting 180 days. At the end of that time, someone is cut off. There's always like a cutting off at the end of this period of time. Vashti is dethroned. He begins the process of looking for a new king. Ends up being Esther, uh, queen, rather. Ends up being Esther. So the next question I jump past. What is the second angel's message in Revelation 14? You read there. Another angel followed saying... Babylon, the great, is fallen. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So, first of all, you notice that Babylon is a she. You're reading in Revelation 14. And she's got wine. And this wine that she is intoxicating everybody with is going to bring judgment on them. It's the opposite of the saving gospel. It's a counterfeit gospel. And it's filled with falsehoods. So how does God symbolize Babylon in Revelation 17? All right, time to go to the Bible. And I'm going to read the first few verses of Revelation chapter 17. Here's where this prophetess, <laughs> this uh, false prophetess, I should say, is introduced. Revelation 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, he came and he talked to me saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit. Now listen carefully to the details. Into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, that's the beast, not the woman, seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, adorned with gold, precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name is written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Here's that mother-daughter team. 
and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great amazement. And you know, I'll jump down to the last verse in chapter 17. We don't have time to read it all. It says, the woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. So most Protestant scholars through history, because a woman represents a church in prophecy, and it says this woman is that uh, kingdom that reigns over the, great, the kings of the earth. Who was reigning over the kings of the earth when John wrote Revelation? It's Rome. And so it narrows it down really quick who this is talking about because it says it's a woman. It's obviously a rich woman, a powerful woman that is in Rome and uh, ends up being a persecuting power. Uh, there's only one big church in Rome that fits this description. That's why the Protestants had real issues with uh, what was happening with the Roman Catholic Church there in Rome. So the answer, the woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. What other evidence from Revelation 17 proves that Babylon is, is referring to papal Rome? Now we're going to look at a lot of evidence here. First of all, it says she is guilty of blasphemy. Blasphemy is when a person, two biblical definitions, one, uh, when somebody takes the prerogatives that belong to God. They uh, either say that they should be treated or worshiped like God, or they say that they have the powers of God. And the church meets this definition according to the Bible. You can read a number of places. Popes quote it themselves. This one is from Ferris's Ecclesiastical Dictionary. The Pope is of so great a dignity and so exalted that he's not a mere man, but as it were, the uh, God and the vicar of God. He is, as it were, God and the vicar of God. Well, I, I respectfully disagree. But uh, I think that we all know if you you know, look at the way that the, the Pope is treated living in uh, one of the greatest pieces of architecture in the world that everything is gilded and people come and, you know, they bow and they kiss the hand. You know, they used to kiss the foot. Tell you a quick story. Um, you know how he ended up with the Anglican Church? Well, King Henry VIII could not get the church to approve his divorce. He sent an ambassador to meet with the Pope to see if they could uh, reconcile and the Pope would agree to uh, you know, prove his divorce so he could remarry. And when the ambassador came, he had a large, like, Afghan, a Russian wolfhound dog he took with him every day, everywhere, this ambassador from England. And when he came in to meet with the Pope, the dog was at his side, and uh, the Pope thrust out his foot so that the emissary could kiss his foot. The dog misunderstood that intention and bit the Pope's foot. The Swiss guard immediately killed the dog which so outraged the ambassador that he turned and left back to England without completing his mission. You've got the Anglican Church. That was what sealed the deal. But now they're reconciling. So that's another interesting bit of prophecy. It says she's dressed in purple and scarlet. Well, this is something that can't be misunderstood. You know, it is the custom, whenever they have any kind of official occasion, that the cardinals wear scarlet and the bishops wear purple. And you can, you know, look at pictures online everywhere and see those are the colors of royalty that are worn by the church. It says she's adorned, adorned in gold and precious stones and pearls. And if you were tuned in for the opening amazing fact, we just highlighted that uh, the Roman Catholic Church has more priceless treasures. It's not, it's hard to determine whether their wealth is greater in the real estate or in the priceless treasures, because, you know, how do you carve up the Sistine Chapel and sell it? And all these statues of Michelangelo and these great works of art that they possess, and all the gilded and the silver saints that are in all of the uh, churches. Quick story. Oliver Cromwell, during his reign in England, they ran out of currency, and uh, he sent his servants through the kingdom to see if they could find some currency because they, they were just out of money. It was all over in Europe. They came back and they reported. He said, the only silver we can find in the kingdom is in the churches, in the statues of the saints. And Cromwell famously said, well, maybe it's time we melt down the saints and put them into circulation, which, by the way, is a good policy for any church. We need to put the saints into circulation. <laughs> but so they, they're fabulously wealthy, and you've probably seen some of the regalia. If you've ever traveled to Rome, then you won't question that. Now, they've lost a lot of cash in the last uh, 20 years because of lawsuits. 
So their great assets now are really in the, the real estate all over the world. Whenever uh, new civilizations were spreading, they, the priests and the Jesuits would go to these communities. They'd establish churches. The churches would grow up around the, these communities would grow up around the church. All through South America, you can see the churches in the middle of town. They own that real estate. It's like, you know, St. Patrick's Cathedral in downtown New York City. Just multiply that towns, times thousands around the world. There's phenomenal wealth just right there. She's called the mother. Now, what does the Catholic Church say about itself? You may be interested to know that the Pope is not only the leader of the Catholic Church, and he uh, kind of rules there in the Vatican, but he is also the pastor of the Lateran Church there in Rome. He is a pastor of a church. And this is the marble plaque in front of the church, and I'll translate the Latin to English for you. It says, The Sacred Lateran Mother and Head of All Churches of the City and the World. So when we use the word mother that you find in the Bible, we're not just trying to make it fit. This is a title that they use themselves. And the appeal of Pope Francis and others before him has been for the strain Protestant children to come back to the mother church. They recognized that most of the Protestant churches fragmented and broke off the mother church. Martin Luther was a Catholic, broke away. Calvin was, John Knox was, and many of the other great reformers. Answer D, she has harlot daughters who are also fallen. Now, I know some of you are getting ready to change the channel because you don't like me using that word. I have to use it because it's in the Bible. I'm not using it to be derogatory. Keep in mind, God in the Old Testament said Israel was his people. He chose Israel. He also said that whenever they were unfaithful and compromised the truth or they compromised with other religions around them, he said they went whoring after idols. He calls them very specifically his whoring church, <laughs> his whoring people. And I know that's strong language, but that's how God feels when his church, that's to be his bride, begins to follow the religions that are counterfeit in the world. And he says, you're being unfaithful to me. You're committing adultery with the devil. And so this is the language you find in the Old and the New Testament, not just for the Catholic church, but for Protestant churches, for the Jewish church, any of God's people through history, when they've strayed from the word, he said they went whoring after other gods. So, sorry for the strong language, but it's in the Bible. It says that the daughters, when the Protestant churches broke away from the Catholic church, they retained still in their bosom characteristics from the mother church. Many of them did not break away completely. Like my Lutheran friends, while they broke away on some very important points, they still continued to baptize babies and a number of other things that the Bible said is not biblical or teach, you know, eternal torment in hell, things like that. So they still had some vestiges of compromise they got from the mother. She persecutes and martyred the saints. Great numbers, and this is from the History of the Popes, page uh, 334. Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and children, stripped and naked, many of them inhumanely massacred. And I think I mentioned earlier in another broadcast that if you want to get um, just a glimmer of what happened during the Dark Ages between 538, when it, the Catholic Church really became a, a political power and began to persecute heresy, from 538 to 1798, literally millions and millions of Christians and Jews were persecuted or killed or tortured. Just look up Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was just not in Spain. It was happening all over Europe. And so uh, you'll get an idea of what happened. She sits upon seven mountains. So it tells us that this woman sits on seven hills. Okay, if, if you're watching, wherever you are, if you've got a smartphone, all you've got to do is Google seven hills. And you know what you're going to come up with? Rome is called the city of seven hills. Those twin brothers, according to the legend, Romulus and Remus, they uh, were born there and, and grew up among the seven hills of Rome, and it's always been called the city of seven hills. And here's an excerpt from, uh, I forget what the excerpt's from. I think it's from Cyclopedia, but I forgot to put it in there. Rome was founded in 753 B.C., the seven hills, a term used for centuries to describe the Capitoline, Grinero, Vemenel, Esquiline, Kellyan, 
Aventine and Palatine Hills surrounding the old city. And I probably slaughtered the Italian. But anyway, you can read that for yourself. G, she rules over the kings of the earth. It's telling us that this woman we just read about in Revelation 17, uh, it says she's sitting on this beast, seven heads and ten horns. When you sit on a beast, it means you're really, you know, you're supposedly the cowboy should be riding the horse, and directing it. And so she is in control. She's riding. And, you know, uh, if you've ever played chess, that game grew up during the time in Europe when every king, every monarch in Europe, there was a bishop in the court or two that were clearing any decisions that the monarch made with the church. The church really had power over the state because the kings might be able to control people while they were alive. The church says, we can control you after you're dead. Whether or not you go to heaven, that was up to the priest to forgive. You had to confess your sins to the priest. And uh, so they had tremendous power. And if the church declared a person was excommunicated, or if the pope said that a kingdom was interdict, and they would declare that everybody in the kingdom was going to be lost unless the king cooperated, the people would turn on their own monarchs. And even to this very day, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, they have audience at the United Nations will gather to listen to them speak. They won't do that for Billy Graham because he is a head of state. And you can just look in the headlines how the Pope became involved and in trying. He brought the president of Palestine, the president of Israel together, a prime minister of Israel, to try to work things out. He got involved in trying to reconcile with Cuba and the U.S. And he's very much involved in politics and frames himself as a peacemaker. And nothing against the individual. I mean, uh, Francis, he reminds me of my grandfather, actually. Looks very much like my grandfather. Seems like a very nice, sincere man. I'd love to meet him and give him a Bible study. So it's nothing against the person. It's the office that they hold that Protestants have always said fulfilled the biblical definition for that first beast in Revelation 13 and the woman of Revelation 17. So how do the beasts of Revelation 13 and 17 compare? Hopefully you got our study on Revelation 13 a couple of days ago and you realize there's two beasts in Revelation 13. First one, we've been telling you, we believe is synonymous with the Roman Catholic Church based in Rome, leader of the Orthodox churches. You know, even the Greek and the Russian Orthodox um, patriarchs and uh, even the English Archbishop of Canterbury have all come to Rome to reconcile with the Pope. The Pope is, he's the head dog there. Um, and the second beast in Revelation 13 is the United States. Now I've told you where I'm going, but then I'll be proving it as we move along. It says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now if you're driving down the road and you see a sign that shows goose crossing, you know that there may be geese crossing or it might say a deer or an elk crossing or a bear crossing and if you're in Alaska it might be a moose crossing but I bet you've never seen a crossing sign where you got a critter that's got seven heads. This is obviously a symbol but notice that this symbol appears several times. You go to Revelation 13.1 well, 13, Upon his heads the names of blasphemy. Now look in Revelation 17.3 I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. There it is again. Seven heads, ten horns. Clearly the same beast. Look in Revelation 12. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Now notice in Revelation 12 the beast with seven heads and ten horns does not have a woman. That's because this was the Roman power ruled by Caesars. When you get to Revelation 17, now you've got the Roman power that is commingling with a woman, a church. Can't be misunderstood. Well, it could be. But friends, what I'm sharing with you is not some new teaching of Pastor Doug. This is a teaching people just have not heard for years, but all of the great Protestant reformers believe this. I'm giving you a quick sampling of some of them right now. I don't want to be tedious. I could read you 30 uh, different quotes. Uh, Charles Spurgeon is called the Prince of Preachers. And uh, he said, Behold, upon her forehead the name, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, 
The church of Rome and her teachings are a vast mountain of rubbish covering the truth of God. He said that the Roman church was obscuring the truth. John Knox, who had been a Catholic priest, and he came out. He became a Presbyterian. He sought to counteract the tyranny which the Pope himself had for so many ages exercised over the church. As with Luther, he finally concluded that the papacy was very antichrist, son of perdition of whom Paul speaks. You can read in uh, Roger Williams, one of the founders of, uh, founding fathers of America, really founded the separation of church and state there in Rhode Island. Pastor Williams spoke of the Pope as the pretended vicar of Christ on earth who sits as God over the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I'm finishing the verse. Exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but over the souls and consciences of his vassals. He is the son of perdition that is prophesied in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's Roger Williams. Cotton Mather, who was a congregational, really a Puritan theologian. This guy, I understood he had memorized the entire New Testament. It's pretty impressive. The oracles of God foretold the rising of an antichrist in the Christian church. And the Pope of Rome fits all the characteristics of that antichrist so marvelously are answered that if anyone who reads the scriptures does not see it, there is a marvelous blindness on them. And, you know, friends, think about it for a second. I, I have to agree with what he's saying. If you want to know a prophecy in the Bible that is easy to understand about the last days, you look at Revelation 17. A woman is a church. You just apply the symbols. It says it's that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. That was Rome at the time John had his vision. It tells us, Scarlet and purple, gold, precious stones, drunken with the blood of the saints. Oh, I haven't even gotten to it all. Wait, there's more. Okay, John Wesley in his commentary on the Bible. That is Europe. This beast is the Roman papacy. As it came to a point 600 years since, stands now and will for some time longer. To this and to no other power of earth agrees the whole text and every part of it in every point. And again, he's talking about in uh, uh, the same verses we are looking at, Revelation 17, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This beast is a spiritual secular power opposite to the kingdom of Christ, a power not merely spiritual or ecclesiastical, not merely secular or political, but a mixture of both. That's what we've been saying. In the last days, you're going to have the commingling of church and state. There's never again going to be a one world government to rule the world. Daniel 2 says the others will not cleave one to another. But there is going to be a religious glue that's going to bring together these governments and it's going to be led by the Pope in Europe and the United States in the Western Hemisphere. If you read the book, All Roads Lead to Rome, he says, a great cloud of witnesses, Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin Kramer in the 17th century Bunyan, the translators of the King James Bible, and the men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confessions of Faith, Sir Isaac Newton, John Wesley, uh, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and more recently Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Ryrie, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, these men among countless others all saw the office of the papacy as Antichrist. We're not trying to be unkind. Like I said, we're not talking about people. And in case you didn't hear me say this earlier, we believe there's going to be millions of lovely Catholic people in heaven from different Orthodox churches, different Protestant churches. There'll be some people in my church that won't make it. People are not saved based on a denomination. But we're talking about prophecy that foretold powers. These beasts in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, were kingdoms and powers that influenced God's people. Some of you remember when we talked about Daniel chapter 2. It talked about head of gold. Let's see if you remember. What was that? Babylon. Then you got the silver arms were made of Persia. The bronze belly and thighs were Greece. Legs of iron are Rome. The feet of iron and clay. The divisions of the Roman Empire. Interesting. Iron is still there. Rome. Clay. It's religion. A mixture of man was made out of clay. And so you kind of get the commingling. It's also what you use to make concrete, iron and clay, which is the number one building material. But in those kingdoms, are we saying those are the only kingdoms that were in the world back then? No, you've got 
There are great Inca empires, a great empire in China, there are great empires in uh, um, India and different countries. And so we're not saying those were the only kingdoms. We're saying those were the kingdoms that had power over God's people during that time. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, they all occupied God's people. Now those have spread around the world. And uh, so now we're talking about global power. What is the meaning and origin of the word Babylon? Well, you can read here in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, 6, 7, and 9. You know, after the flood, they didn't want to scatter upon the earth. They said, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. The Lord had told them, don't do that. He said, go, spread out, subdue the earth, be fruitful, multiply. And they said, God might flood us again. We better build a tower in case we need to save ourselves. And they said, we want to do it to make a name for ourselves. God was not pleased with their disobedience. God said, let us go down. Here's an example of the Trinity, plural. Let us go down there, confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And to this very day, if you say someone is babbling, and the reason you have the word baby is because babies babble. And it means when someone is speaking in a way that no one understands. So right there at the beginning, you've got these kingdoms that are in conflict between Babylon and Jerusalem. The early word for Babylon was Babel. Early word for Jerusalem was Salem, where Melchizedek was king. And they both grew, and they sort of became uh, opposite poles of God's people and the kingdom of lies that the devil ruled over. How does God describe Babylon in urging his people to leave? And he, the angel here in Revelation 18, verse 2, he cries mightily with a strong voice. By the way, friends, you're hearing that voice right now. He cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit come out of her, my people. You've got to just pause there. God has his people. This is what this says. Jesus said, I've got other sheep that are not of this fold. The Lord says, I've got my people in Babylon. Keep in mind, the children of Israel were captives in Babylon. He called them out. Abraham brought his wife out of Mesopotamia, as did Isaac, as did Jacob. They all came from across the Euphrates. And God, before Jesus comes, he's calling his people out of the confusion of Babylon into his fold that we might be one people and reflect him. And this message is going to the world. Come back to the Bible in the truth. If you don't, notice what it says. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. You may say, what sins are we partaking of? When you support a movement that is teaching lies, you are basically underwriting their sins. You become an accomplice and become responsible for spreading untruth. And if the truth sets you free, lies enslave. Jesus repeatedly indicates, uh, in, in, indicts Babylon for making the world drunk with her wine. What is this wine? Notice Revelation 17, verse 4. Having a golden cup, isn't that interesting, in her hand, full of abominations, and you read in the Catholic Encyclopedia, the chalice that's used during the Eucharist, the Mass, is the most important of the sacred vessels. And the big battle in, one of the big battles in the Protestant movement was what they call transubstantiation. In the Catholic Church, they say the priest, by going through the Latin rites of the Eucharist, uh, you've probably heard uh, the expression before, um, hocus pocus. Because there's a phrase, and I can't say it, but it's the corpus is a word that the priest uses when he's supposedly transferring the, uh, the bread into the actual body of Christ. And people were teasing the priest. He said, well, when he goes through his hocus pocus, when he spoke in Latin, he said, I am converting this into the actual body of Christ and blood. And Luther said, that's blasphemy. You can't create God. A man does not have that power. And there's a big battle over the golden cup in the mass. Something else you'll find interesting is Jesus, when he had the last supper with the disciples, he gave them grape juice. It was unfermented wine. Christ said, I will not drink this again until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. The gospel of Christ, he says, you don't put old wine, or don't put new wine in old wineskins. It's the new, unfermented. The bread was to be unleavened bread, 
That was a symbol of sin if it was leavened. Unleavened bread and unfermented grape juice. But in the Roman Catholic services, it is intoxicating drink. And I remember as I was a kid, I went to the military school, New York Military Academy, and every Sunday I was required to go to services. And uh, I didn't want to go anywhere because my parents were pretty much agnostic. My dad had been Baptist growing up. My mother was Jewish. My parents had sent me to Catholic school. And so I would rotate from week to week between Protestant, Jewish, and Catholic services. And I remember going to the Catholic service. The priest had to hold several services that day, and he drank a little of the grape juice. He gave all of us the bread, but he didn't give us any wine. He just drank the wine. But he was tipsy by the end of the day. And I thought, even as a kid, I thought, there's something wrong with that. And I also remember him smoking during the Mass. But um, so it just seemed really strange to me. But you see that very picture, don't we? It tells us about the woman has a golden cup, and in the cup is the wine. Now, what did, what did Jesus say that grape juice represented? His blood. It's the gospel. It's the truth, the teachings of Christ that washes us from sin. But in the cup of Babylon, it's not pure. It's got something rotten in it. That's what fermentation is. And in the doctrines, there are some true doctrines that I would agree with my Catholic friends on. There's things they believe. I believe in reverence. There's things they believe I believe in. But they've got some doctrines of devils that have compromised with pagan religions that drifted from the teachings of Christ. And we're going to find out what those are. For one, the Ten Commandments are not binding. This is some of the wine of Babylon. that you, The Ten Commandments have, can be altered or changed by a man. Here's an example. You can read in Daniel 7.25. It says, This beast power would think to change times and laws. Now, I've got a picture here. This is in front of a Catholic church, I think, in, Miss, in, in Michigan. And uh, you can look online. This is the Catholic version of the Ten Commandments. You'll notice something right away that the Second Commandment about idolatry is not there. The other thing you'll notice is the third commandment says Sabbath. That's supposed to be the fourth commandment. And the tenth commandment, the way they keep ten, is they divided the tenth commandment that said don't covet your neighbor's wife or his house or his ox or his donkey. Or anything. That's all one commandment for the Jews and the Protestants. But in order to get rid of the idolatry one, they cut that one out and they changed the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day. Think to change times and laws. And they say we have that right. Sunday sacredness. Here's an example of that. Uh, nowhere does it say that the first day is to be a holy day. That was the Roman day of the sun. They worship the sun. Have you any other way? This is from the Catholic Catechism. Have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Yes. Answer. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. That's actually not all, but that's what they say. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. So they said, we've got the power to change the law. The secret rapture. The idea that Jesus is coming secretly and the saints are going to be caught away. You know where that came from? No Protestant church believed in the secret rapture. Uh, all the Protestants used to believe when the Lord came, it would be visible, glorious, everyone will see it, and that would be Jesus catching us up. The world would be destroyed. The Lord comes like a thief. The elements melt with fervent heat. And then at the end of 1,000 years, we return down to earth. But when millions of Catholics began to pour out of the Roman Catholic Church because they were listening to the teachings of the Protestants, they read Revelation 17, they go, wow, that's hard to miss. What the Catholics had to do then is they had to come up with a counter-interpretation of those prophecies. The people said, well, if it doesn't mean what Luther's saying, what does it mean? And they hired a couple of uh, priests, Alcazar and Francisco Ribera, Jesuit priests, and they wrote this whole new interpretation of prophecy that's called futurism. Well, they had one version that's called preterism. They said, oh, all these prophecies will, were fulfilled by Nero because Nero wore purple and uh, scarlet also. And uh, he had gold, and so they, they tried to fit that and the other idea was we're going to get it to go into the future anything but point at them and this whole new future interpretation of prophecy came out it was adopted by um, Darby and it was put into Schofield's Bible and then Hal Lindsey read Schofield's Bible and he wrote a book called Late Great Planet Earth and it went from just a few churches believing 
the Catholic version called Futurism, to now most Protestants are teaching the Catholic version of the Second Coming about the secret rapture. And we do believe we're going to be caught up, but it's not a secret, and the tribulation happens before Jesus comes. So that's one of those doctrines. They got people all mixed up. The immortality of the soul. We went through this in our study. Where in the Bible does it say that we have immortality without Jesus? Those that believe in him have everlasting life. Those that don't perish. God and God only has immortality. And so this whole teaching that you can't die, that's what the serpent told Eve in the Garden of Eden, and that's what many pastors are telling their congregations. He said, you're immortal. You'll live forever in heaven, or you'll live forever in hell, but you can't die. You're immortal like God. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the soul that sins will die. You have two choices, life or death. There is a resurrection. There is punishment. But you don't live forever and ever in the fire. Just think about that. Eternal torment. That's where I was heading right now. Not to eternal torment, but to the subject. Yeah, the idea that, um, and th this became convenient. They took this kind of from Greek mythology and <clears throat> Pluto in charge of Hades and the hounds of hell. And the idea being that um, if the church does not pray you out of purgatory, and if you do not pay your relatives out of purgatory or out of limbo, then they're suffering this incredibly horrific torture that you can't even imagine. And it was a very powerful way to manipulate millions of people with fear. But it's not what the Bible taught. God is a loving God. God is merciful. He's making a universe where there is no more pain, no more sorrow, more, no more tears. All things are new. There's no more sinners. Even Satan himself, the Bible says, I'll bring forth a fire from the midst of thee and it will devour you, and I'll bring you to ashes on the earth in the sight of those that behold you, and you will be a terror, and never will you be anymore. You will never be. You cease to exist. God says, I am that I am. He's eternal. Satan is not eternal. And so God's going to destroy sin. He's going to destroy sinners. Another doctrine that many Protestants adopted, like the Mother Church, that is not in the Bible. Confessing your sins to a priest. Well, the Bible says confess your faults to one another and pray for one another. It never says to confess your sins to a priest. It means as, as Christian brothers and sisters, we say, you know, I'm struggling. Can you pray for me? Or I've got this weakness. But you don't confess your innermost sins to a person, and that person can't forgive you. And the idea that you have to confess all your sins to a priest, first of all, I would hate to be a priest and listen to people tell me all their salacious problems all day long. What's that got to do to a person's mind? That can't be healthy. And uh, you have to listen to that. And, and uh, you know, you've heard the expression, too much information. God says we're to confess our sins to him. God and God only can forgive your sins is what the Bible teaches. Jesus said, call no man father. You have one father, which is in heaven. And yet this church says, call the religious leaders father, the word papa, if the, for the pope. It's meaning the great father. Counterfeit baptisms. Bible says that before you're baptized, you need to be taught, you need to repent, you need to believe with all your heart. Baby can't do that. Now, parents may have dedicated you as a baby and they called it baptism, but that's not Bible baptism. Bible baptism is where you consciously understand the gospel, you repent of your sins, and you come for that cleansing. It's a, it's a choice, like marriage. Jesus was dedicated as a baby, but he wasn't baptized till he was 30. So if you had to get baptized as a baby, Joseph and Mary would have done that back then. And then you've got this confusion of tongues that's become part and parcel of so many churches. And again, I'm trying to speak graciously. I'm hitting things quick because I've got so much I'm trying to cover. But um, before Pastor Doug learned the things that I know now, when I first accepted Jesus, you heard my story. I was living up in the mountains in a cave, almost no Christian background. I mean, I went to two different Catholic schools and I went to some Jewish schools, but I knew almost nothing about the Bible. And I read the Bible, started going to church on Sunday. Most of the churches I worshiped with were evangelical, charismatic churches. A lot of good friends, lovely people. I expect to see many of them in heaven. But they would break off into speaking in tongues and they'd say, Doug, you don't have the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues. I said, that's not what I'm seeing in Acts. I just couldn't. And they said, well, you, you need to just let go and let the Spirit take over. And I said, well, I, I don't say it. And they said, well, here, just say hallelujah. You say hallelujah. Say it quicker. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And they try and get you to keep saying hallelujah until you're just stumbling over yourself. And they say, that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
I said, no, I don't see that in the Bible. Jesus said, you will speak with other tongues. He told his disciples, he had 12 very bright but formerly uneducated apostles. He said, I want you to go tell all the world. You will speak with other tongues. Acts chapter 2, on a holiday when devout Jews from every nation came to Jerusalem, he pours out the Holy Spirit. He gives the disciples the ability to speak other languages they had not formerly known or studied. Miraculously, the people listening know what they're saying. They said, how do we every man hear them speak the wonderful works of God in our own tongues wherein we were born? They were miraculously given the, the ability to speak in other languages. That's the gift of tongues and the gospel went everywhere. But the, the repetitive, empty babbling where a person doesn't even know what they're saying you do not find that happening in the Bible. So, and you read all three examples of tongues in Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19. The people present in all three, there's multiple language groups, they all understood what was being said. Prophesying, they're talking about God. It was for the purpose of spreading the gospel when there were different language groups that didn't understand. So, but that's been taken to just a whole different level today. Babylon, Babylon. It's one of the examples of what's happening in many churches. What power will support the beast in the end time? And I beheld another beast. Here it comes. Coming up out of the earth, not out of the water. You read in Revelation 17, the waters are multitudes of people, tongues, and nations. Two horns like a lamb. Now when we read Revelation and in the Bible, lamb, good or bad? Jesus, behold the lamb of God. Two horns like a lamb. Starts out good. Dragon, good or bad? Goes bad. Two horns like a lamb. Beast starts out good, but he speaks like a dragon. The waters represent a populated area that must represent, if the waters represent a populated area, the earth coming up out of the earth must represent a sparsely populated area. You read in chapter 17 of uh, Revelation, the angel told John, the waters that you saw where the woman sits are multitudes of people, languages, and tongues. It's talking about densely concentrated place. Rome came up right in the middle of the Mediterranean, surrounded by literal water and civilizations. Great, heavily, densely populated civilizations. What continent began to suddenly spring out in history following 1798? It's interesting. 1776 is when we signed our Declaration of Independence. But we were not recognized by the other countries of Europe as an independent country from England until 1798. And there's no question about what country this is talking about. It's North America, United States in particular. And we, we kind of like to use the buffalo as a picture because compared to some of the big oxen and bovines they've got in Africa and Europe, it has small horns like a lamb. But it's a pretty fierce two-ton beast. Two horns represent the two big principles of strength that made America great. Unlike Europe, we had a government without a king. They tried to make George Washington king, and he turned it down. He said, no, we don't want to go back to what we just rebelled against. And uh, they had a church without a pope. Freedom of government, freedom of religion were the two horns that gave America its strength and its power, and everybody wanted to come. And by the way, they still want to come today. Because in spite of its flaws, it's one of the best places in the world to be. So starts out with two horns like a lamb. Many of the founding fathers, though they were imperfect, they came and they were really looking for religious purity. They wanted America to be that city on a hill that would share the gospel with the world. And you can read the documents of the founding fathers. And sometimes they were very sincere, but sometimes they even persecuted those that did not go along. And, but they started out with, you look in the Constitution, we believe that our Creator has endowed us with certain rights. And so the Founding Fathers believed there was a Creator, and that's where we got those rights. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. Starts out like a lamb, freedom, explodes with growth between World War I and World War II, becomes the premier superpower in the world. And he causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. That's interesting because if Europe, if the central power in Europe, in Rome, for religion, was there the papacy, Roman Catholic Church. America was the beachhead for Protestants of the world. 
You know, in the last 50 years, the United States has sent more money, more Bibles, more missionaries around the world than any other country. Uh, the United States gives more charity around the world. So it, it has represented just the Protestant ethics. But it's going to rejoin with the Mother Church and recreate an image of what happened during the Dark Ages. That beast that was wounded, it came back, that persecuting religious political power. I don't know if any of you remember this uh, article from February 24, 1992 called The Holy Alliance, Time Magazine. It's a great report that explained that what brought down communism was an alliance between the United States and the Catholic Church. Ronald Reagan had a very important meeting with Pope John Paul II. I think I showed you a picture. My father met him uh, once years ago. And uh, through solidarity, they knew they could undermine Europe in Poland. And if they could do that, they'd get a foothold and it would begin to fall like dominoes. All the countries would want freedom, and it worked. And you can even go to Poland now. I think this is in Warsaw. They got a picture of Reagan and the Pope in bronze, not a picture, a bronze statue, of them walking. It was uh, the union of Protestants in the United States and Catholicism trying to restructure the world. Uh, who could forget this picture when John Paul II died? Here you've got three U.S. presidents on their knees before the Pope. And you know what's really strange is that Protestants don't believe you pray for a person after they die. Uh, but in the Catholic Church, they do. And uh, all of those presidents are ostensibly from a Protestant background. And then in 2015, Pope Francis came to the United States, and I've mentioned this earlier, and I repeat myself because I know some people don't get every program. He went to all the places that were the founding for the U.S. government. Our capital used to be New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. He went to all those places, plus he addressed a joint session of Congress and the United Nations in one trip. What was left out? And uh, received superstar status and coverage nonstop on the media. Things have changed. You know, when the United States, th this is what's really amazing. See that picture here? You've got, of course, the Vatican flag, which is state flag, and the American flag side by side on the Capitol Mall. And the Washington Monument, I don't know if you know, but when the Washington Monument was being built, the U.S. said that if there were some of our friend nations that wanted to donate a marble block, we gave them the specifications that we would put it on the inside. They needed to have matching marble on the outside. The Vatican sent them a marble block. And that so outraged some of the builders, um, Masons in particular, they took it, they threw it in the Potomac River. They said, we don't want anything from the beast. Well, how have things changed between then and now? And it says an image to the beast. Kind of interesting. You get the, the Romanesque architecture in the Vatican, the dome, and I don't want to make too much out of it. I just think it's an interesting visual of uh, the United States Capitol and the Vatican. And then you've got right in front of the, uh, the U.S., you've got the tallest uh, obelisk in the world in the Washington Monument. And then, of course, in front of St. Peter's, you've got another one. And it says the U.S. will make an image to the beast that they'll be reaching across the gulf and joining hands. According to prophecy, what drastic change will take place in America? It starts out like a lamb, but he speaks. Now, how does a nation speak? It speaks with its laws, with its legislation. A nation speaks through its laws or legislative body in the rules and telling people how to live and what to follow. Interesting right now, uh, 50 years ago, every member of the U.S. Supreme Court was a Protestant. Now there are no Protestants. Now I think there are seven Catholics, one's Anglican Catholic and two Jews. And all lovely people, and I don't think religion should be a test for office. I believe that. I'm just saying, I think it's interesting. It's noteworthy. People ought to just go, I'm making a note of that. That's no Protestants anymore. And they used to all be Protestants. And, if, you know, I frankly believe that a person's religious beliefs will influence how they think. If your religious beliefs do not influence how you think, you need new beliefs. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. The, the beast received a deadly wound by the sword from the Protestant Reformation. And, uh, you know, the Bibles, it's interesting, Martin Luther, he translated the Bible into the language of the people. The Gutenberg Press, first book they printed, was a Bible. 
Bibles began to go like crazy throughout Europe. Everybody could read the Bible and they said, wait a second here. We're reading Revelation. And, oh, this, is, this can't be a coincidence. Scarlet, golden cup, purple, pearls, Roman city, woman. And they said, wow. And all these people began to flock out of the church and they lost a lot of power. Finally, of course, when Napoleon took the Pope captive, it was, uh, looked like a death blow, received a deadly wound. But they were reinstated as an independent country during the time of Mussolini in 1929. And now they're reconciling the wound. Pope Francis says over and over, we want to heal the wound with our Protestant brothers and sisters. And he's working very hard to do that. He's met with the uh, Coptic patriarch, the Russian Orthodox patriarch, the head of the Greek Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church, everyone from Rick Warren to Joel Osteen. He's been very active. Kenneth Copeland meeting with Protestant leaders saying, we need to be one. Keeps quoting John 17. What three powers will unite against God's people in the end time? And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth. This is talking about speaking. Of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now it says frogs because frogs of course an unclean animal. A frog catches things with its tongue. So it's with the words. And it says that they're going forth to the kings of the earth to gather them together to the battle of Armageddon. Just like in the Old Testament the witch did signs and wonders for Saul before a battle where he was judged. And there's going to be spiritualism. Will these diverse organizations ever effectively unite? It says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles that go forth to the kings of the whole world to gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And the Bible says, Jesus inserts a phrase, behold, I come quickly. It said, read a letter in your Bible. It says, he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. What effective methods will this end time coalition utilize? The United States, Catholicism, and spiritualism. They are the spirits of devils working miracles. There's going to be signs and wonders, and, but are they real miracles? Didn't Jesus say, beware of false prophets that come to you? False Christs? Working miracles. He does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men to deceive those. So these miracles are going to be used to get everybody to be very sincere about persecuting Bible-believing Christians. And they're going to do it in the name of the Lord. Jesus said in John 16, the hour is coming when he that kills you will think that he's serving God. You know, the apostle Paul, he was killing Christians and he thought he was serving God until God got his attention. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles that he had power to do in the sight of the beast. And what will prevent God's end time people from being deceived? What's going to be our safety so that we're not overcome or deceived in the last days, friends? It's going to be, thus saith the Lord, the word of God, to the law and the testimony. That means the law and the prophets, the word of God. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That doesn't mean, well, you know, if they got 70% right, then don't worry about that other 30% of error. Or maybe we'll tolerate 20% of lies and 80% truth. God's going to call together people in the last days that are going to return to the faith that was once delivered to the saints, the faith of the apostles. It's going to be a Bible-based religion. During this seminar, we've been inviting people to come out of Babylon and to be part of God's movement and, you know, if you're wanting to know more about that, I hope you'll go to the Revelation Now website. You can contact us. We'll pray for you. We can put you in contact with people where there are Bible-believing churches in your neighborhood. If we can find any, we will certainly try. And, but this is a time for that message to go out, for God's people to come back, and you will experience an abundant life, joy and blessings, and, and uh, the Lord will get you ready for his soon return. He's got a work to do in you and through you. So today God's calling people out of Babylon. It says, come out of her, my people, that you receive not of her plagues, that you're not guilty of her sins. Jesus said, I've got other sheep. They're out there in Babylon. They're his sheep. He says, my people. But he wants them to hear his voice and come out. You don't just come out of Babylon. You come into the body of Christ. You become part of his people. We'd like to encourage you to make that decision, friends, and say, yes, I want to 
I want to take a stand for God's truth and be part of his people. And friends, I hope you will choose to be part of that remnant church in the last days. I'd like to pray with you before we close. And don't go far. We're going to have our Bible questions in just a few moments. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the, the power and clarity of your word. We just sense we are living in the last days. We see these things being fulfilled before our very eyes. We know that you're looking for a people that will be a part of that church that is based on the rock of Jesus and his teachings. And I pray each person listening will have the courage to know how to take that step of faith like Abraham and come out of Babylon into the promised land. Bless each one, Lord. Be with us in our meetings that remain. We thank you and ask in Christ's name. Amen. Don't go away. We'll be back in just two or three minutes with Bible questions. An international pandemic killing thousands. Riots ripping communities apart. A global economic implosion. Many are wondering, is this the end of the world? Few question the military, economic, and technological might of the United States. So if we really are facing the last days, if these worldwide catastrophes are really harbingers of the end, shouldn't we expect the United States to play a key role in the final events of Bible prophecy? What does the Bible say? Friend, the book of Revelation provides unmistakable clues. And to help you understand them, Amazing Facts is releasing America in Bible Prophecy, the future of Earth's last superpower revealed. It's gonna take you step by step in identifying the global forces at work in these last days. Could religious freedom be at risk in this land of liberty? You might be surprised what the Bible really says. You owe it to yourself to find out. So get yourself a copy of America in Bible Prophecy. Welcome back, friends, to uh, Revelation Now, and it's time for your Bible questions. So if you, if you do have a question, go ahead and type it on the Facebook page in the comment section. We've got some that's already come in, some very good questions, Pastor Doug, so we're looking forward to answering them. And we do have some that we'll put up on the screen to get us started this evening. So our first question today is, uh, did Satan's kingdom, called Babylon, originate at the Tower of Babel? Well, I think it originated technically a little before that with a Nimrod, or, uh, you know, tells us before you get to chapter 11 about Nimrod during the genealogy, and it says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. I think that's the first mention. Uh, the tower part may have come after he had people congregating in the area. But, uh, yeah, and it, even after the tower fell apart, it seemed like people continued to live in that area because you got these great Mesopotamian kingdoms, um, Many of the empires that we read about in the Bible were in the area where we have Iraq today. Mm -hmm. And our son was stationed in the Marines there during uh, the first Gulf War. And you go look at the old ruins of Babylon. And so, uh, yeah, that uh, not only during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, but you remember reading during the time of Hezekiah, messengers were sent from Babylon and even before that. And then we all have heard about Hammurabi, the king of Babylon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also interesting to note that the Old Testament sometimes been described as a as a story of two cities. You got God's city symbolized by Jerusalem. Then you have the enemy of God's people symbolized by Babylon. Mm -hmm. And you have throughout the Old Testament the story going back and forth and eventually the Jews get captured, captured by the Babylonians but then they get set free and they come out of Babylon. And then you find that parallel even in Revelation. So it's an interesting theme that you see mm -hmm. throughout the Bible. Yep. Especially in the Old Testament. Contrast of the two kingdoms. Mm -hmm. All right, second question that we have. 
Will the New Age movement play a major role in the final end time conflict between good and evil? Well, I'll say yes, but I probably ought to define things a little bit. When you say New Age movement, uh, um, we don't hear that phrase as often today, but I think it's talking about some of the mysticism that is in a lot of the, mm -hmm. the churches, the idea of meditation mm -hmm. that kind of came from some of the Eastern mystical religions. And uh, it was really big, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the hippie movement when I was uh, going through that age in the 60s and 70s where everyone was you know, meditating and believing in reincarnation and the spiritualism and, and uh, you know, some of those principles have infiltrated Christianity. I think it will play a part. I, I don't know if we'll be calling it by that title or that's going to be a major movement, mm -hmm. major part. Mm -hmm. It's interesting there is a push in towards spiritualism even amongst Protestant churches where we set aside the authority of the Bible and we go with some sort of a experience or mm -hmm. a feeling that supersedes the Bible. So yeah. you've got to be careful That's well of that. That's well stated. That's what sort it is. Sort of a Christian form of, if you want, New Age or yeah. spiritualism. All right. Our next question that we have is Revelation chapter 16, 12. What does it mean when it says the waters of the river Euphrates being dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east? Yeah, this, it says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. I saw a news report that kind of, <laughs> I think I've shared it with you, kind of got my attention that um, during the ISIS fighting, they had shut off the floodgates of a dam upriver from um, uh, up the Euphrates. Yeah, up the river from Baghdad. And it said, the headline said the Euphrates River is going dry. And <laughs> it gave me a little goosebumps. <laughs> I thought, wow, that sounds a lot like the Bible prophecy. <laughs> And it is a, this is not the fulfillment, but I think it is interesting to note that because the nations upstream, Turkey and others, are taking so much of the water of the Euphrates, they used to be able to navigate the Euphrates River, and they can't do it anymore. It's, it's like a bunch of stagnating pools. So it is literally drying up, but that's not what Revelation's talking about. Uh, knowing the history, not all of it's in the Bible, but knowing the history of what happened to Babylon and how it fell when uh, Cyrus the Persian was uh, besieging ancient Babylon. Now you can read about the handwriting on the walls in Daniel chapter 5, that he ultimately diverted the river Euphrates into a dry lake bed, and where it normally ran under the walls of Babylon, the water level dropped so much that a contingent of the Persian soldiers got under the walls. They were able to, they had left open the inner gates. They never thought they'd get scuba dive underneath. And they opened the gates to the city. They then opened the gates for the army to come in. So the drying up, Cyrus drying up the Euphrates meant the fall of Babylon. And so in Revelation, when it says the drying up of the river to make the way for the kings of the east, well, that was like Cyrus and Darius in the Old Testament. But the kings of the east, the Bible tells us, and I read it today in my devotions in Ezekiel, it talks about the Lord uh, it, as the light of the east. And so these kings of the East, talking about uh, God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are coming, and it's the liberation, really. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting to note, Pastor Doug, water in Bible prophecy, you probably mentioned it today, in Revelation 17 represents multitudes and nations yeah. and tongues and kings. And so the drying up of the river Euphrates also symbolizes the withdrawal of support that's been given to this power of Babylon in the last days. When people begin to realize they've been deceived and they withdraw their support, that yeah. prepares the way for its downfall. Absolutely. Which yeah. culminates in the second coming of Christ. It, yeah. it's, it's basically the harbinger of the fall of Babylon is when the waters go dry. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to look at a few of the questions that folks have sent in. And this question is, in 1798, the Catholic Church received its deadly wound. Is there another prophecy that talks about it getting its power back? Well, it says in chapter 13, it talks about um, the deadly wound was healed. Mm -hmm and all the world wondered after the beast. And so it does mention the healing of the wound. And then when you get to Revelation 17, it shows she's alive and well at that point. And that's really, I think, talking also about um, what happens in the last days. Revelation 19, when Jesus comes to uh, judge Babylon, and you've got uh, Revelation 18, I think, is the fall of Babylon. Um, it must rise again for it to fall again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's also interesting you mentioned that as far as receiving the deadly wound and the wound being healed, I think you mentioned it tonight, 1929 
when the papacy actually became an independent political power, the smallest kingdom on the earth. And now it's, if we can just see in the headlines, how that the papal power, the Vatican, has grown in influence around the world. Oh, yeah. So the, the wound is well on its way to being healed. It's not fully healed yet, but it's well on its way. You think about it, you get a country with a thousand people, roughly, yep. that live in the Vatican, 109 acres, and look at the international clout that they have. Very influential. There's no other country, I mean, you know, Liechtenstein. Yeah. I mean, they don't have a big impact on the world affairs, right. but the Pope does. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. All right, another question that we have. What Bible version should one use? Well, good, and of course, this would be our answer here is going to be subjective. It's going to be either my or Pastor Ross's opinion. Um, you know, we don't want to dictate what, and you, I imagine you're speaking of English translations because, you know, you go into different languages and they've got different names for their versions. But uh, I typically, I love the King James Version because I think it had the greatest defining influence on the English language. Um, but it's, you know, it's a little archaic, and so I use the New King James Version, which is translated from the same manuscripts called the Received Text or the Textus Receptus. New American Standard's a good version. The English Standard Version's a good version. I'm reading through the whole Bible. I'm always reading through the Bible every morning. Now I'm going through the English Standard Version. And reading different versions sometimes gives you a little deeper insight because the translators pick things up. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference between a Bible translation and a paraphrase. Yes. You know, we have that radio program and we get people calling in. Typically around the beginning of the year, they always ask the question. We've heard it many times. So uh, did the angels come ha and have take wives uh, here on the earth and giants as a result were born and uh, part of the reason why people come up with that as they start reading in Genesis is because a paraphrase that yeah. doesn't quite accurately translate the original Hebrew. Yeah, exactly. And you'll s find some of the paraphrases. That's just anybody. I could make a Bible call it the Bachelor Bible and I could just put it in my words and say this is what I think it really means. Not all of them are done very carefully. You get to Revelation 13 and I know... Um, one Bible, I think it's a good news Bible, it calls the mark of the beast a tattoo. And that's great liberty that is not really in the original text. It's, it doesn't say that. So it confuses people. Okay. How can you tell if you have the Holy Spirit in your heart? Well, Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. And if you see the fruits in the life, you know, the reason he, he Jesus said uh, a thorn bush doesn't produce figs. So if you've got a thorny heart, you're not going to have figs. You're going to have... Um, thistles <laughs> so you know you'll you'll start seeing the fruits of the spirit in your life uh love joy peace long-suffering goodness patience temperance meekness and um you can ask your neighbor if they think you've got the holy spirit <laughs> and they'll probably tell oh, you your the family truth. member <laughs> ask your spouse just wait and ask, find the right moment to ask that question <laughs> okay Another question we have is, uh, why is China not referred to in Bible prophecy, seeing that it's such a big country? Yes. And I'm just finishing, uh, you and I go back and forth, we're reading different history books. <laughs> we like reading history also. I'm finishing uh, The Adventures of Marco Polo. And boy, China was such a massive country, and it has been for millennia. And, uh, but the countries that are typically mentioned, I said during our, our lesson tonight, are the ones that had a great impact on God's people. Now, China is mentioned in the sense that Jesus said we go to every tongue mm -hmm. and nation. And uh, it is one of the tongues and nations. And a matter of fact, Amazing Facts has got a very popular website. One of our most popular websites is our Mandarin website, Chinese website. Yeah. So there's a lot, the Christian church is exploding in China even in spite of the persecution. And I've seen it firsthand. Okay, another question that we have. Here's a good question. What do I do if I'm a lukewarm Christian? Well, what does Jesus say there in Revelation That's chapter 3? Yeah. He said, uh, repent. Mm -hmm. He says, I wish that you were hot or cold. Now, that doesn't, hot or cold does not mean saved or lost. Hot means that you're, you're in touch with the Lord, you're on fire, you're out working for the Lord, you're zealous. Cold would mean you're in a state of repentance and seeking after God. God can work with either of those conditions. It's when we think everything is okie dokie and it's inky stinky, to quote Lucille Ball, sorry. <laughs> but uh, then if folks think, I'm rich and increased with goods and I am in need of nothing, um, he can't work with that condition. So he wants us to buy of him the gold and the eye salve and the white raiment, talking about the love, have our eyes open with the Holy Spirit, accept the righteousness of Christ and really have a conversion experience. You find it through the word, which brings convic 
bottom line says, we love him because he first loved us. So if you want to be converted and love him, you need to know him. You know him through his word. If you spend time talking to the Lord in prayer, letting him talk to you through his word, work to serve him, you will find your love for him grow and your conversion experience will deepen. Okay. Another question we have, can the devil read my mind? No. Uh, the closest he can probably get is what a person can get in which sometimes you can tell what a person's thinking if you know them well enough. And just as God has guardian angels, I expect the devil has got uh, demons that are assigned to different individuals, study their weaknesses. And when a temptation comes, they can sometimes judge your, your facial expressions and body language and figure if they're getting through, but they can't read your mind. I believe it's, uh, well, there's three or four places it says only God can read the hearts of man. One is that uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 30, for God and God only knows the thoughts of men's hearts. And Jesus knew what was in man, John chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 says Christ knew what they were thinking. Only God knows what's going on in your gray matter. Okay, with everything going on in the world today, how can I overcome anxiety? Christ offers you a peace that passes understanding. And, uh, you know, when you know your sins are forgiven, when you know that he's given you a gift of everlasting life, and you know he'll never let go of you. As long as you keep your eyes on him and stay with him, you have nothing to fear. And no matter what happens in the world, the Bible says a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but only with your eyes will you see the reward of the wicked. That's Psalms 91. And you just have a peace that you really, you know, God's spirit wraps you up in his arms and you can sleep like a baby at night because, you know, your life is in God's hands. God, mm -hmm. Jesus, over and over, even in a storm, he told the disciples, where's your faith? He doesn't want you to be in fear. Oh, by the way, can I do a plug here? I just finished a book about how you can live in peace in a world of worry. And you just come in, it's like ink is dry. Because so many people are worried right, right now. And I got a bunch of principles in there about how a person can. Just ask for Pastor Doug's worry book when you call Amazing Facts. Okay, here's another question. You might have to give a little bit of a background on this, Pastor Doug. What happened to Jephthah's daughter? Good. Now, the Bible tells about one of the judges whose name was Jephthah. And uh, he made a vow before he went to battle with, I believe it was the Midianites. And um, he said, Lord, if you'll give me victory in this battle, uh, whatever you give me, I will, uh, I, when I come home, whatever comes out of the gates of my house, I will offer as a burnt offering to you. You know, back in these rural ranch-like communities, when they'd come home, I used to have goats. When I drove home, they'd all run out to meet us. They're farm animals. They're sheep. They're goats. You know, Nathan tells a story to David about a family had a prized sheep. They'd come out and meet him. They'd always want to come get fed. Pastor Ross and I visited somebody when the cows started chasing us. <laughs> he thought they were attacking us. I said, no, they think we got food. <laughs> so Jephthah thought that the, um, he'd come home. He was victorious. He thought he'd come home and one of the family animals would come out. But his daughter was first out of the gates. And he said, oh, alas, my daughter, you brought me very low. I've opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot turn back. And she said, Father, do to me whatever you promised. So she bid her girlfriends farewell. He then brought her to the temple and dedicated her as a living sacrifice to the Lord. He did not burn her. Uh, the Bible said that, you know, for every firstborn you were to make a sacrifice. You, God did not endorse human sacrifice. And it says that the daughters of Israel would go up yearly to weep with the daughter of Jephthah. She was still there, just like Samuel's mother, after she dedicated Samuel, would come every year and bring him a little coat during the feasts. The daughters of Israel would come and visit Jephthah's daughter. You read in the New Testament about Anna, who served God in the temple from her virginity. And uh, Jephthah could never, Jephthah's daughter could never marry. He would have no offspring. It was his only daughter. And so it was a real tragedy. She was consecrated to serve God. And that's one place where some of the Catholics get the idea of nuns never marrying. They use Jeff, the, his daughter, as an example. Okay. Uh, here's another question. It says, I am 10 years old, and I've always wondered, did King Nebuchadnezzar ever change his wicked ways, and will he be in heaven? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it's kind of wonderful. You read at the end of Daniel chapter 4, and whatever the name of the person is, I hope you'll go look that up. Nebuchadnezzar was very proud, but God humbled him. He basically turned into little more than an animal for seven years. At the end of seven years, God let his reason come back 
And he said, I now worship only the God of heaven. And I know that he can set up or take down even the basest of men. And um, I read in the spirit of prophecy that you, he was a converted man. He wrote one of the chapters in, in the book of Daniel. Yeah, he, we, chapter four is mm -hmm. his composition. Right. Okay, another question that we have in the last little bit here. Should Christians get tattoos? Uh, Leviticus is a chapter 19, verse 18. It says, you shall not get any tattoos nor make any markings in your flesh. I sometimes mix up, I know it's in Leviticus, I mix that verse up with the one that says, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. That's 1918. This one might be Leviticus 18. Just type in uh, tattoo if you get New King James Version. It'll come up. Pastor Ross and I, we search for Bible answers. Uh, I always tell him to look on his computer. <laughs> All Just right. Google it. It's, <laughs> it's there. I know I've seen it. We're getting old, friends. Pray for us. You know it says, thou shalt not make any cuttings, cuttings in your flesh. You're not to make any markings, not to cut the corners of your words. It talks about for the dead, but it's very clearly says you should not get tattoos. Yeah, I can't put my finger on it. You know part of the problem? Yeah, it is. Okay. Leviticus 19, verse 28. 28 shall not make any go. cuttings in your flesh. You know, part of the problem is we read both the King James Version and the New King James Version. And the words and sometimes are sometimes the wording's a little different. So you're searching in the New King James and using King James language. So it won't find yeah, it. Part computers of the are dumb sometimes. <laughs> they don't always do it. It's the computer's want. fault, honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our last question then for this evening. And let's see. Let's get a good one here. Um, how can we recognize a true prophet from a false prophet? Ooh, good question. If I don't cover all this in our time, then ask it again. But first of all, their life will be in harmony with the word of God. Um, they will not prophesy anything that is contrary to the word of God. Um, if they make a prediction, it will come true. Moses said if a prophet makes a prophecy and it doesn't come true, then they're not a prophet. Um, they'll be humble. If they ask you for their credit card your credit card number before they give you a prophecy, they're probably not a true prophet. You don't have to pay a true prophet to get your prophecy. Um, the true prophets in the Bible gave it whether you paid them or not. Matter of fact, Elisha said, keep your money. Mm -hmm. and so a prophet sets, that right there will eliminate most false prophets. That one thing there. But there's several other things. We have a lesson, I think, that talks about does God inspire psychics and uh, astrologers. And in that lesson, if I'm not mistaken, we've got a list of criteria on how you can discriminate between a true prophet and a false prophet. And of course, that's available at the Revelation website, just revelation.org or .com. Click on the, the studies and look up the one, Does God Inspire Psychics or Prophets? Yep. And I uh, want to remind our friends in the last few seconds here, don't forget about the free gift that we have, America and the Ten Commandments. If you'd like to receive this, just text the word commandment to the number 40544, and you'll be able to get a digital download or just visit Revelation Now. Dot com. And of course, Pastor Doug, we want to remind friends that we will be meeting again tomorrow evening. A very important topic. Yes, we're talking about Babylon's buffet. Okay. Friends, we're going to be giving you some secrets how to postpone your funeral. If anyone's interested in postponing your funeral, don't miss this study tomorrow night. I think you'll be greatly blessed. And it, I think you're going to find uh, you'll smile a little too along the way. Not too late to invite your friends to join us. So tomorrow evening, look forward to seeing you again here on Revelation Now.